Well, I think obviously Star Wars is the thing that's most in the news and the thing that most excites the imagination and indeed the anxieties. What do you think is going, would be the result of this whole Star Wars project? If we were so foolish as to go ahead with it, I think uh, the net result would be after the expenditure of uh, a million, million dollars, um, that uh, we would be far less safe than we are today. The President's own technical advisors make it clear that this proposed shield after 30 years of development would be exceptionally leaky, would let through enough Soviet warheads if the Soviets chose to attack the United States to uh, utterly destroy the United States and uh, perhaps to bring about nuclear winter as well. The Soviets can outfox the system, underfly it, overwhelm it. It uh, is ruinously expensive. It abrogates in a, a large number of treaties that the United States has solemnly signed. Uh, and in addition, it is likely to bring about nuclear war itself if uh, the Soviets were to believe, as they say, that it is a uh, part of an American plan for a first strike. Apart from that, it's a terrific idea. <laughs> I'm saying, probably one of the most cheerful prognoses I've heard in a long time. So, well, you, well, we have the option uh, not to do it, I, uh, I suppose, in which case uh, things could be still more From cheerful. your knowledge, do you think it's likely that uh, President Reagan will do it? Uh, no, I don't think so, but uh, presidents come and go, and uh, we're talking about decades, so I think they're... Uh, mm. that it, Obviously, you feel that the money spent on that could be more usefully spent on many other things, but among other things, on exploration, further exploration of outer space? Certainly, but a million million dollars is uh, uh, considerably more than the total debt owed by uh, all third world nations to, uh, to the West. It's something like half the uh, national debt of the United States. It is an extraordinary amount of money. It's an incredible amount of human good that could be done for that. And a tiny fraction of Star Wars could uh, could purchase the most uh, extraordinary sorts of uh, ventures in space, including uh, manned and womaned missions to the planet Mars and elsewhere. But do you think that people are as excited by that prospect as they used to be? It all seemed to have gone a little bit cold, hasn't it? Shortly after they found that there was nobody on the moon, and as you told them, there wasn't anybody on Mars as well, <laughs> it all got a little quiet, didn't it? Well, I... Uh... I think uh, if you look, for example, at the uh, Voyager robot explorers of uh, the Jupiter and Saturn systems in 1979, 1981, after the events you just described, you uh, find an extraordinary outpouring of uh, public interest all over the world. The planet Saturn was on the cover of uh, Time and Newsweek and uh, other uh, magazines in America and here. Uh, we are an exploratory species. We wish to understand uh, who we are, where we are, what our surroundings are. When you study other worlds, you learn much more about your own. You provide an aperture to a benign future. And all of this can be done at the tiniest fraction of what we seem uh, quite happy to spend on uh, military systems. To give you an example, uh, in March of next year, uh, Halley's Comet will be coming by the Earth for the first time since 1910 and uh, it will be greeted by a flotilla of uh, five spacecraft from 20 nations, including the United Kingdom, but not including the United States. Why not the United States, the pioneer in solar system exploration in, uh, in the history of the human species? Why not? Because a Democratic and a Republican administration decided it was too expensive. How expensive would it have been? It would have cost exactly as much as a single B-1 bomber uh, for which the United States is committed to purchase 100. 99 would have compromised national security. <laughs> listening, to, listening to the way you tell it, uh, do they listen to you in the White House, though? Do they? Obviously not. <laughs> yes, or, or in the Pentagon. But, uh, Carl, I, I remember reading one of your books, and you, you did say in the course of it, as I remember, not very clearly, um, if there was anybody out there, they'd have a hell of a time finding us, and that we are going to have an equally almost impossible task finding them. First of all, do you think there's anybody out there or anything that could communicate with us? Well, the Milky Way galaxy is composed of some 400, I'm, I'm converting from American numbers to British numbers, 400,000 million separate suns, each of which more or less uh, 
like our own. We now think that, uh, that planets are a commonplace, that uh, most uh, of those stars probably have planetary systems. We know the origin of life is uh, likely under uh, general cosmic circumstances, and there were thousands of millions of years for evolution to happen. Under those circumstances, it seems uh, extraordinarily arrogant of us to think we are the only inhabitants yeah, yeah, of this cosmos. How are we going to find them, though? I mean, it, okay, that's, that's so there's I'm, two I'm, questions. How are they going to find us? Right. The first thing to uh, to bear in mind is that uh, sort of tooling around uh, the galaxy in uh, in spacecraft is uh, a very inefficient way to do it. And what's more, as you said, no way for them to know anything interesting is happening here. Um, but there's another way, and that is to uh, use a technology which you know well, and that is uh, radio. Radio signals travel at the speed of light. We could broadcast the Encyclopedia Britannica to the nearest star in a week with existing technology. We could communicate, if you wanted to do that, you could communicate uh, uh, to any star in the galaxy with the technology not much beyond our own. And therefore, the way to do this is to, for them, the smart guys, to send radio messages, and for us, the dumb guys, to listen. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And it's, uh, it's but, so inexpensive. The, but there's no sound coming through. There's no, no, not sound, not sound, radio. Radio, yeah. but they're not coming through. We haven't heard any bleeps. Well, but we've just begun to, to listen. What happened to that? Was it Voyager you designed this, um, this little placard, little sign, in case anybody came across it, of a man, a woman, and our, our position That's right. within the, the solar system. Right. Did nobody's... Well, it hasn't gone anywhere yet. You oh. must be patient. The, uh, it seems to be a long time. <laughs> for human, in human terms, of course it is. But uh, there are four spacecraft, Pioneers 10 and 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, which are, are on trajectories that will ultimately take them out of our solar system. And then in interstellar space, they will uh, last for thousands of millions of years. For that reason, it makes sense to put some greeting card on there in case anyone picks it up. But at the present time, those spacecraft are well within our own solar system. They are the fastest objects ever launched by the human species. They are traveling so fast that it will take them tens of thousands of years to go the distance to the nearest star. And they are not headed towards the nearest star. So in fact, Dr. Carl Sagan, you're not expecting a postcard immediately. No, we haven't. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Dr. Carl Sagan.